Here is one of four LED floodlights that I recently got off eBay. These are rated 50 watts and you can get them in sets of one, two or three that are then marketed as 50 watts, 100 watts or 150 watts. Now the 150 watt version was sold out so I got two 100 watt versions. So I now have four of these and I thought before I set these up I should probably test them to make sure that they are any good. So as we take a look at this uh, light as you can see we have a long rectangular cob LED in there. Cob meaning chip on board. This has this uh, plastic cover over it. it. says LED floodlight IP66. So it is supposedly uh, waterproof and dust proof. Uh, as you can see the back is uh, all heat sink. Some extruded aluminum for that. Uh, right here is the power input. These will connect straight to the mains as you can see and nice surprise they do have a safety ground connection. That's good. The sides are made from plastic. As you can see, they have these uh, screw knobs on either side to uh, mount the LEDs. And with the 100 and 150 watt version, you do get brackets so you can, uh, you can mount these slides together. First of all, I'd like to find out if the 50 watt LED light really is 50 watts. Now, rather embarrassingly, I don't have a watt meter, so all I can do is measure input voltage and input current and calculate the apparent power. So, here we go, let's turn this on. This is very bright and unfortunately very flickery. I hope that only happens when you aim the light straight at the camera because I was hoping to use this also as a video light. But anyway, so input voltage is 235 volts and the input current is 153 milliamps. Oh, what a disappointment. 36 watts. And it gets even worse, because remember, this is apparent power. Apparent power is the sum of effective power and reactive power. And with this being just a very simple LED light, I'd say the power factor is probably rather bad, meaning we have a lot of reactive power in the system. So if I had to guess, I'd say the actual effective power of this LED is probably around 20 watts. Yeah, that's disappointing. Let's now take this thing apart to reveal the inside. I've already loosened these eight screws. The plexiglass cover now comes off like so. And there is actually a silicone seal all around, so this is waterproof. The mains cable I just checked, it uh, slides into this extruded aluminum profile from the side. So it looks like it was just held in place by silicone, but don't worry, there is a proper strain relief. So here is the heart of the light. There we can nicely see the cob array of LEDs. And then this down here is the power supply, which is unfortunately all covered up by this uh, white paint. This thing I have already measured. It measures five point something ohms. So this is probably a fusible resistor, which is nice. This could be a capacitor, could be an MOT. And then what everything else is, we will never know. Continuing on, I have removed all the screws holding this module in place. So let's see if we can take that out. Uh, maybe here. Uh, not really. 
I'm doing this to check if there is any kind of uh, thermally conductive material under this. Now, there we go. That's the module out. And, oh, yes. We have, yep, heatsink compound. Plenty of heatsink compound, so that's good. And, oh, God. Okay, well, that is no good whatsoever. The safety ground is not screwed into anything. So, good thing that I checked, as I now need to fix that. But at least there is heat sink compound, because otherwise I would have had to put some of that into there as well. And I fixed it. So, what they originally did is they just jammed this connector in between the module and the aluminum heatsink, which, number one, it's not a reliable connection. Number two, it forces the module away from the aluminum heatsink. And you may have just been able to see by the way the heatsink compound was spread out that originally this corner of the board had no proper contact with the heatsink, which is bad. So, as you can see, very simple repair. I extended the existing ground connector to over here, and thankfully this screw is long enough so that you can still tighten it down even with this connector in place. And then some heat shrink tubing to insulate the connection. And there is the light all back together. Does it still work? Yes, it does. So, what is the conclusion? Well, the light does not have the technical specifications that it should have, and the way it comes, it's electrically unsafe and requires a modification. But then, on the other hand side, the set of four lights cost me 40 euro, so that's 10 euro a piece. This light, this whole entire thing, cost only 10 euro, so in the end, I guess it's another case of you get what you pay for. I have now finished modifying the last two of the four lights. So here they are, mounted in the frame that they come with. We have two side pieces holding the two together, mounted to the knobs. And then we have this uh, center piece, which uh, does swivel. And then, of course, the two individual lights can be moved as well. I now have the mains wiring completed for the lights. The two power cables are combined in this uh, junction box. This is just a standard small size German junction box. You can pick these up for really cheap over here. They are like two euro a piece. Use the screw terminal to connect everything. It is important uh, when you want to put this flexible wire into a screw terminal, you have to solder it. Because if you don't do that, the individual cores of the flexible wire will separate and you don't get a safe connection. And this is especially true for this uh, cheap Chinese wire. I don't know what they make this stuff out of, but really the only way to keep it under control is to solder it. And then I used some cable ties as a strain relief. So that is this junction box. Stuff that in there and close it up like so. There we go, nice and neat. And that then connects to a generous five meters of lamp cord, which terminates in this uh, vintage wall plug that I was able to reuse, or no, nowadays you gotta say upcycle. I guess when this plug was made, LED technology had not yet been invented. <laughs> And here are the two LED lights set up and working. And it seems like I can use them for video, as I certainly can't see any flicker right now. I have them aimed up at the ceiling. Oops, well, there we go again. Might just be one certain shutter speed that the phone 
does that uh, causes the flicker. Anyway, I have them aimed up at the ceiling, so light bounces down onto this table that I use for making photos. And as you can see, there is now some nice, bright, and even light for that. I have the two lights mounted to these stands. These are some proper light stands that I got along with these. These are some battery-powered LED lights that unfortunately turn out to be total junk. And here is what I've used previously. I had a 400 watt halogen light, only one, because, uh, well, as you can see in this one, the bulb has burned out. And then I had this uh, 20 watt LED work light. It might be interesting to measure if that really is 20 watts. So anyway, I can now clean up that mess because I have something better. And to all of you who are now going to say, oh, this is junk, this won't last. Well, I had the light that I finished first running while I modified and built the second light. So it's been on for several hours and it still works. And when I'm making photos, I'm usually not running the lights for any longer than an hour. So, that's it. Thank you for watching.